Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Coffee Science Seminar. My name is Ali Raza, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at Center for Animal Science. First of all, I would like to start with acknowledgement to the country. Ida, can you please go to the next slide? I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. I pay respect to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. Before I introduce uh, to our today's speaker, um, I would like to mention a few house housekeeping um, points. This seminar is scheduled from um, 12 to 1 p.m. And at the end of the seminar, we will hold a question and answer session. If you have any questions that you would like answered, please use the question and answer button at the bottom of the screen, not the chat button. And we will address them at the conclusion of the seminar. Our today's speaker is Dr. Lida Omaliki. Lida is working as a senior research fellow at the Center for Animal Science. She is a veterinarian from Iran and completed her PhD in veterinary microbiology at the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences, the University of Melbourne in 2013. Lida has worked as a research assistant with Coffee in 2012. She came back to Coffee in 2017 as a senior research fellow. She is presenting her work on application of whole genome sequencing in diagnosis and control of livestock diseases. Over to you, Lida. Thanks a lot, Ali, for the introduction. And thanks a lot for um, the opportunity to talk to you today. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, please let me know, Ali, if, um, if I'm not loud enough or too loud. So yeah, I, you're fine. Okay, thank you. I too acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet today and pay my respect to their ancestors and their descendants. Um, our group works uh, with intensive animal industries, especially poultry, pig, and cattle industry. Today, I would like to focus on, on work that our group does on the members of the family pastoral ACA, which are a particularly challenging group that includes major pathogens. So, um, as an outline, I will uh, talk about a little bit about my background and uh, where I come from, and then uh, talk about the clouds project that I was involved uh, with, and then came back to Kwafi as a research fellow, as well uh, as some other ongoing projects that we are now having uh, with a summary and a hint about the future works that we would like to continue. So I am originally from Iran, um, it is in Middle East. A lot of people think it is a very dry country. However, as you can see here, um, some parts are full of uh, rain. I come from this city here, it's called Sari, under uh, Caspian Sea. And um, yeah, it is a very interesting part of the world with uh, lots of uh, interesting countries, neighborhood countries. And I'm sure you all know about what's going on in Afghanistan at the moment. So anyway, I grew up in a, a family we, uh, who are landowners and farmers. So I grew up uh, spending a lot of time with my dad on uh, his sort of lands. We grew rice, wheat, cotton, soybean, canola, tomato, citrus, you name it as well as we have a sort of a traditional farm that uh, we have some cattle, sheep, and goat. I did, uh, despite, uh, I did my uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine in Iran in University of Tehran. And then before coming to Australia, I worked for six years uh, as a dairy cattle nutrition and mastitis consultant. 
So um, dairy industry in Iran is a big industry and um, uh, the industrial ones are uh, dairy herds between 30 to 600 milking cows. So uh, sorry, the ones I worked with, but uh, they are in the range of, they can have up to 10,000 cows at a time. Um, but the ones I work with were in this um, uh, sort of size. And you can see, because some parts of the country gets very uh, hot, we cool our cows with these huge uh, fans, as well as sprinkling water on top of them when it is very warm during summer. Then um, we feed them like a, mix, a total mixed ratio with the silage and different grains, and also the average milk production with the like a industrial sort of production are between seven to nine ton per lactation per animal with the 3.3 percent fat and 3.2 percent protein and um, this part of industry is uh, Holstein uh, cows imported from Israel or Europe um, in old days. Um, Moving from that, I decided that uh, to come to Australia and I started my PhD working on um, role of Manhemia species in ovine mastitis. And uh, which is uh, ovine mastitis is a particular problem, especially in pole dorset. And there are a lot of pole dorsets uh, throughout Australia, especially I think in Victoria and then in the border of uh, Victoria and New South Wales. And, I joined my PhD supervisor, Stuart Barber, who is originally from Bernala. He also grew up um, in a sort of farmer family. So his dad um, and his grandparents had always uh, had Paul Dorsets and he always worked in the genetics of uh, Paul Dorsets. And uh, also he had a big passion about the sheep industry. So we, uh, he is a lecturer in the University of Melbourne. So our work on sheep mastitis was, uh, as you can see here, it is like a picture of a healthy uh, ewe udder. And then mastitis can be in these animals can be very devastating. It can end up like as a black mastitis, which uh, the tissue becomes gangrenous and eventually the animal suffers a lot and uh, eventually dies. And even, even if it survives, you can imagine that this animal is no, uh, of no use because it cannot feed the lambs. We um, also looked at the Manhemia population in the nasal cavity of the sheep and then compared those from the nasal cavity of the lambs with those we had from the mastitis. And then we could see that the same population um, then by using DNA fingerprinting, the same population of bacteria, which are uh, commensal uh, in their nasal uh, cavity, they can also they are also responsible for causing mastitis in the ewe. So a bit of a background on the Pastoralaceae family. It is the um, family tree for uh, Pastoralaceae. Organisms of this family inhabit mucosal membrane of alimentary, genital, and respiratory tract of many animal species. And um, as you can see here on this tree, there are pathogens in this family for all major livestock, including human, as well. Some of the organisms are of zoonotic importance. So I did my PhD on Manhemia uh, down here in the red box, but then I joined Coffee in the, in the research um, fellow position in 2017, working on Pastorella multocida, another member of this family. The focus of the project was on uh, foul cholera, so the disease this bacteria causes in free range uh, chickens especially, but then we, the, uh, we work on Pastorella from different uh, hosts as well as uh, you can see on uh, marsupials and uh, also seals. And at the moment we have a number of projects working on the whole genome sequencing from different organisms within this family. So I start with Pastoronomaltosida. It's a um, foul cholera, which is caused by this bacteria is a major threat to the rapidly growing poultry industry, both in Australia and in other countries. 
Pastorella maltosida is a highly heterogeneous species from this family and causes a range of markedly different diseases in domestic and wild animals, you name it, poultry, wild birds, pigs, cattle, buffaloes, rabbits, small ruminants, cats, and yeah. Um, it also, you, we can also, it has been also uh, obtained from the uh, respiratory tract of Komodo dragons. I took this picture uh, just last week from the Australian zoo. And it was always interesting for me how Komodo dragon has pastorella. And then looking at the fact sheet is that they prey, I didn't know that they prey, they prey on pigs and even buffalo. So no wonder they can harbor pastorella multosida as that. Anyway, um, so originally cage egg farming was introduced to provide for the fast growing global egg demand, as well as protecting the chicken flocks from uh, predators and diseases like avian influenza. However, the shift back to free range production system has increased the exposure of the chickens to wildlife. Um, like migrating birds and predators, like cats and dogs and dingoes in Australia, both of them, uh, all of them carrying different types of this causative agent, Pastorella multosida. The mortality of the disease can be up to 20% and higher in naturally infected animals and up to 100% in experimental condition. However, we have seen mortalities up to 55% in free range chicken beet flocks through to processing. And once the disease uh, starts, antibiotic treatment is the only way of controlling foul cholera during an outbreak. And overseas studies indicate that 80% of Pastorella multosida show resistance to the antibiotics in use. So there is a big concern out there. Prevention of the disease is with vaccination, beside the biosecurity management, is with vaccination. We have a live attenuated vaccine in Australia, as well as killed autogenous vaccine. And the focus of my talk and my project was and is on a killed autogenous vaccine. The key point about the killed autogenous vaccine is the outer structure of the bacteria in the vaccine should be exactly the same as the one which has caused the disease for the vaccine to provide protection. So it is all about out, uh, the outer structure of the bacteria, which is uh, the lipopolysaccharide. And in this case, in Pastorella multosida, it is the outer uh, side of this uh, outer membrane. So we call it the outer uh, lipopolysaccharide or the outer LPS. It has been a lot of uh, attempt to be able to type this outer structure because uh, it has been known forever that um, the protection is only homologous protection, if you like. So it has been head uh, serotyping. So antisera was has been raised by injecting the killed bacteria uh, to in either host um, to either chicken or rabbit and then using that antisera for doing um, gel uh, precipitation assays to be able to understand what is the serotype of the bacteria and then use that in the vaccine. Um, so the, what there are problems with this traditional serotyping, this traditional serotyping only identifies 16 serobar by this technology. There are few laboratories on, in the world that can perform this typing. As you can imagine, it is very laborious and uh, to make the antisera. And then some field isolates identified uh, as not typable and also they cross react with different antisera. So, um, sorry. So then later on, uh, Pat and Connie, together with uh, collaboration with Monash University, with a project funded by industry, they uh, managed to uh, analyze and identify this outer structure and the analysis and also analyze the genetic region coding for this outer structure. 
and uh, eight different genotypes were identified, which were uh, which were responsible for making these different uh, outer structure or serotypes, if you like. And you can see in this picture, like some genotypes are shared between some serovars. Um, a multiplex PCR is in use. So when the field isolates arrive, we can do a multiplex PCR and then identify which LPS uh, genotype they have. However, for example, in Australia, in the foul cholera story scenario, most of the isolates carry LPS type 3. However, LPS type 3 isolate have the capacity to produce six different outer structure. So even if we do this multiplex PCR, we are not sure which of these outer structure the bacteria has. And then it means that if two foul cholera isolate have the same LPS uh, type in a genetic region, they do not necessarily produce the same outer structure or protector type, if you like. Therefore, they might not cross protect. So our uh, aim, uh, one of the aims of the project was to see if we can extract the LPS genetic region from the whole genome sequencing and then do the typing and through whole genome sequencing. The genome of the Pastorella multocida is 2.2 million base pair, nothing uh, compared to the crops and also the uh, beef um, genome, but it has its own challenges, I should say. The genes uh, which are responsible for building this outer structure they are all in the same loci, they are clustered together. Here I show an example of LPS type 3 uh, outer core biosynthesis loci which is made of a number of transferases and biosynthesis genes. So the role of these genes are they code for transferase enzyme, and this enzyme gets the substrate, which will be different sugars like a galactose, glucose, and then they, um, in a simple word, they make the outer structure. So for the second enzyme in the row to be able to do its job, the first enzyme should be healthy and working, and then the second enzyme can add the second um, glucose to the structure. If a mutation happens in the first gene and the first enzyme is not doing its job, then the second enzyme won't have its uh, base to add its sugar, and then the structure will be truncated. So this is how different, if you imagine about this outer structure like uh, different branches of the tree so this is how if a branch is cut and then the shape of the outer structure is different then the immune system uh, if it is vaccinated if the chicken is vaccinated the immune system cannot recognize that um, protector type or that antigen so looking at the sequence of this region and looking at uh, from over 200 pastorella multocida isolates from chickens only we see a lot of diversity. Uh, then it comes to the point that LPS3 itself has lots of subtypes. Um, and putting it in a context of more schematic, um, sorry, I made these schematics because I had to present this data in uh, for the farmers, for the chicken industry, as a part of telling them how we are spending their money and um, that's how I made these uh, schematics to, uh, in an attempt to make it easier to follow. So um, the LPS, so if we imagine the genetic, uh, genetic region, these are the genes, the CDS, and the two lines here, the top line uh, with the yellow arrow is the nucleotide, and then the one on the, uh, below is the amino acid uh, translation. If everything is intact and uh, the gene is working in the wild type, the outer structure will be like this, if you like, with different sugars. And then I show it as an orange um, type. Any, uh, if um, the field strain in the amino acid as well as in the uh, nucleotide is exactly the same as the wild type, it is shown with the gray area any point of mutation, any change between the, the wild cup and the type strain is with the black line, as you can see here. And any insertion sequences in the field strain will be represented by a sort of a space here as a gap in the reference. 
So looking at the field strains, we could identify a seven base pair insertion in some of the field um, strains. I show it with a sort of a blue line here. And uh, because it is in this gene, this transferase, which is called NATC, and is responsible for adding this last sugar, then it will be no uh, added last sugar. So it will be definitely a different you know, shape in the bacteria or outer structure. Then looking at this region, we actually uh, found out that this seven base pair insertion in this glycosyl transferase is a single copy duplication of one half of an imperfect tandem repeat, producing a three unit tandem repeat array in the mutant. So what it uh, simply means is when the bacteria is um, uh, replicating, at some stages, uh, it, they can get rid of this um, mutation. And then in their progeny, if you like, there is a chance of the, it goes back to the Y type and then the bacteria can produce the full outer structure, again, uh, escaping from the protection. So this mechanism is called phase variation, which is a reversible high frequency switching of gene expression. This is uh, used by some bacteria to produce different phenotypic variants, and uh, it is like a bacterial defense mechanism. It allows an organism to generate a phenotypically diverse population. Uh, for example, um, different antibiotic sensitivity, uh, phenotype or escape from the host immunity response, which we have seen here. Some of these um, some of these have identifiable features, like you can look at the genome, genome and then identify this region, uh, like the one I just showed you. They have simple sequence repeats, and then some of them have homopolymer tracks, like poly A, poly Gs, or uh, things like that. Then the importance of it is when we, uh, when we go back and map all this information, so our lab has a, a collection of the field strains as well as the vaccine strains. So in during this project, we looked at this variation in the vaccine strains over time, as well as the field strains. So when we look at it, you can see here, for, for in this farm here, for example, in 2011, they were using this white uh, strain in the vaccine. But then later on, they had outbreak of bowel cholera which was uh, produced, which was as an uh, effect of introduction, this blue strain, which had this seven days per uh, insertion. Therefore, it was a very bad outbreak. Then uh, at the time, this blue strain was added to the vaccine. Then in 2013, there was a new outbreak with the yellow strain, if you like, which was without that um, in insertion site. Then um, obviously the vaccine was not effective and uh, it went on, nothing happened. It wasn't added, unfortunately. And uh, later on, there was another outbreak, a new uh, deletion were identified in this uh, isolate. And then this way, we can see how uh, in the past, how there was introduction of new isolates uh, to the farm with different outer structure and now we, when we can understand why the vaccine uh, was not helpful and was not effective in preventing of the disease there. And um, that is, um, again, we can very beautifully map this. And here as well, we can see a co-infection of the farm with two different strains. So that sort of um, application that we can uh, do with whole genome sequencing. A little bit about uh, what uh, we are doing with the, the PIC projects at the moment. Uh, so porcine respiratory uh, infections are among the most important diseases of growing pigs. In most cases, it is not just one pathogen that uh, causes the respiratory disease and it's associated with a complex of pathogens, uh, bacterial and viral. Uh, hence, it is uh, usually called uh, as a defined as a multifactorial disease. Sorry. 
Um, and this, um, this porcine respiratory disease complex is defined as a multifactorial disease of finishing peaks, especially between 14 to 20 weeks of age. I briefly mentioned our work on actinobacillus pleuronomonia as well as Gracilella australis, and hopefully um, um, I will present some more later uh, in the year or next year about the uh, exciting work that we are doing on that. So actinobacillus pleuronomonia is one of the most important causative agents of porcine pleuronomonia, and one of the main symptoms is that the pigs have difficulty in breathing. More, uh, and eventually the pig die with bloody discharge from their nose and their mouth, which is um, obviously not very, um, a lot of concern of the welfare of animal, as well as economic loss for the industry as well. It affects pigs when they are between 18 to 22 weeks old. And most pigs in Australia are slaughtered around 22 weeks old. So you can see how important uh, is economically on the farmers. And uh, there are a lot of problems with the vaccines, and uh, which are not sometimes working effective, effectively. There are 19 serovars of actinobacillus pleuronomoniae. Uh, some of them are very pathogenic, some of them are mildly pathogenic. And um, you can see in the picture here, uh, the work done by Connie, and you can see the differences between the pathology of different serovars um, here. So um, for the typing, as I said, there are uh, 19 serotypes uh, worldwide. Uh, in Australia, we have four uh, serotypes uh, at the moment. And uh, the, one of the most important virulence factors of uh, actinobacillus pleuronomoniae is its toxin. And uh, the toxin of APP, as we call it, is from the RTX family of toxins. These toxins are shared between a lot of different gram-negative pathogens, like E. coli, like manhemia that uh, I did my PhD on. So, uh, and they have four um, regions, like the structural toxin, the activation part of the um, toxin, as well as the secretion, which is the part B and D. And uh, we do a lot of toxin profiling because uh, APP uh, has the uh, three different toxins, APX1, 2, and 3. Some of them can be cytotoxic, some of them can be hemolytic, and um, uh, it, they are very important in the pathology of this organism. So at the moment, apart from other projects, we have one project with this a problem that in serotype, uh, serovar 15 isolates that um, we have in some of the pig farms, we expecting the LPX2 and 3 to be present and the way we identify it is by uh, PCR. However, what we can see at the moment uh, that in the PCR only can detect the LPX3 but cannot detect LPX2. So we have our uh, Carol, our uh, master's in bioinformatics student, who is looking at the genomics of the actinopole uh, APP isolate and trying to solve this mystery for us. Um, moving on, there are have been other. Uh, there has been a lot of outbreaks of porcine uh, respiratory, uh, respiratory porcine pneumonia that the lesions on farm and uh, as well as in abattoir, they looked very similar to actinobacillus pleuronomoniae, but um, we couldn't identify the causative agent. It wasn't um, actinobacillus pleuronomoniae or other known bacteria that we have been working with. And um, then it, all this work on this specific uh, case ended up of the discovery and naming a new uh, pathogen within the family Pastoralaceae that is now named uh, as Glacerella australis. And we have, um, and the interesting thing is this um, bacteria also uh, using the genomic work, it showed that it has APX3 toxin as well. So there is a lot of work to be done in this area. Uh, we, we, and we have Chen, our PhD student who is working on the genomic of the Glacerella australis and in association with the disease in our pig farms in Australia. 
So in summary, um, whole genome sequencing explained vaccination failure in uh, foul uh, cholera and helped us a lot. So now we are getting more and more requests from the uh, chicken farmers to apply whole genome sequencing to help them for the um, isolate selection for the vaccination. And then uh, our work has shown that uh, using whole genome sequencing has shown for the first time the role of phase variation, as I said, uh, gene switching on and off for the first time in pastoral multocida as a way that it evades the vaccine pressure, which is quite exciting. And um, whole genome sequencing is now in use to explain pathogenicity uh, due to different toxin profiles in actinobacillus pro pneumoniae, and uh, we are trying to use it to ensure better diagnosis where key virulence genes, APX in this case, are shared between pathogens, as I showed in APP and a Glacerella australis. So in future, um, and uh, what we have started now is to use the culture independent whole genome sequencing uh, by Nanopore, which is quite exciting and I'm really excited to start my work on it. Of course, uh, none of this would have been possible without uh, the industry support and our funders and the collaborations uh, we had. As well, I would like to um, thank Pat and Connie specifically for the great support uh, in life and in, uh, in work. And it's been a great pleasure working, getting to know you and uh, working with you everybody in a microbiology research group, um, a family, uh, past and present. It's a wonderful family and I enjoy every moment of it. Uh, and I would like to especially thank um, Scott Beatson from uh, Beatson Lab in ACE and his group who have been quite helpful and uh, they are still very helpful. So I would like, um, uh so thanks a lot so now i will hand it back to ali to handling the questions thank you lida for an amazing talk um a wonderful piece of work so we have some questions in the q a uh first question is from uh paula yeah. she say can cocktail vaccines be used to cover the diversity in case of um foul cholera it's a wonderful point, Ala. Um, yes, so I think the problem at the moment is that the farms are working individually and then the diversity is very big out there and there is a limit on the number of uh, this uh, CFU <laughs> bacteria to include in the vaccine. So the rule of thumb, to my knowledge, is they... Again, I don't think there has been any work done on this, but they usually put three different strains maximum in, a, in one cocktail. And then the diversity is much bigger than that out there. So we have been, um, so there are some off the shelf, I think vaccines out there, but um, the strains there hasn't been uh, quite identified or subjected to LPS identification yet. Hope I answered your question. Thank you, Lina. Uh, the second question is, has phase variation in genes that code for key protective antigens been recognized in other members of the pastoral SC family, particularly those infecting livestock? Um, so, Phase variation has been, first of all, I start with human because Haemophilus influenza uh, is a major, um, is a member of this family and um, it's been worked a lot on and uh, phase variation has been shown in relationship to virulence in uh, Haemophilus influenza, non-typable Haemophilus influenza. As well, our group is a working collaboration with Griffith University. We have a PhD student, um, Nostrad. She is working in phase variation in actinobacillus pleuronomoniae. So I guess in short, yes. 
but um, but our work was the first work uh, to show it in pastorella multocida. So the literature always said um, there is no evidence of any phase variability in pastorella multocida, but um, our work showed it for the first time. The next question is, are the protector types, I don't know, are the protector types you have described for inactivated vaccines also relevant for live fall cholera vaccines? It's a very good question. So the case of live vaccine is that <clears throat> the live vaccine doesn't have this protector type or a um, heterologous uh, protection issue. So the studies show that, for example, the live vaccine, which is in use in Australia, is used by a strain that carries LPS type 1. But uh, studies show that it can uh, provide protection against strains carrying LPS type 3. However, field veterinarians are not uh, quite confident about the direction, duration of protection. So, um, in the heterologous protection. But again, to answer your specific question, this heterologous uh, protection is um, a problem with the killed vaccine, not with a um, live vaccine. The next question is, uh, how similar is the APX3 toxin in G. australis to that present in a pneumonia? Um, I think by using whole genome sequencing and then um, at the moment, I think it was around 84% amino acid similarity between the APX uh, found in uh, Glacerella and APP. So it was 84% amino acid similarity between that and that from the APX3. Mm, okay. And the next question is, can bioinformatic analysis suggest whether the appearance of APX3 gene in G. australis is a recent event or something that happened a long time ago in evolutionary history? Um, I, the answer is yes, uh, it should be able. <laughs> I'm not an expert in that part, but I think yes, it should be able. So I am hoping to a part as time goes on and um, I also learn more and more. So that's one of the, uh, one of the things that I have in mind to apply some whole genome bioinformatic analysis uh, to the pastoral ACA family to be able to look at the evolution of this APX gene with the isolates that are carrying it. Great. And the next question is, has G. australis been recognized in countries outside Australia? Um, to be honest, not very sure. We had uh, some reports from um, France and uh, we are working uh, to on that uh, uh, together with uh, people from uh, Europe in identification and um, confirming it is exactly geosterolis. Okay. Our next question is from Felicity McIntosh. Uh, thank you, Lida, for an excellent presentation. Will we be able to keep in front of these diseases with whole genome sequencing and vaccine alone? What other things do we need to do, for example, biosecurity-wise? Thanks, Felicity. Biosecurity is, of course, very important, wonderful point. Um, a lot of, so as I mentioned, this uh, foul cholera was not... Uh, they uh, kind of disappeared in Australia, if you like. And this going back to free range, also as consumers makes us feel good <laughs> about that our chicken are coming from free range and they are happier, but has some consequences, which um, makes this, um, so the animals became uh, free range, but the biosecurity measures may not has developed as much because a lot of our farms, our chicken farms are next to our pig farms. And then there are wetlands around them that are um, visited by uh, migrating birds and things like that. But it is a wonderful point. I should mention that in one case, even the farmers themselves are not uh, sometimes aware of these biosecurity points. So we had one 
uh, farm that uh, had four different um, farms in different uh, locations, and they had far cholera going in their farm A, then they would take all the carcasses of the dead bears to next to their farm B, and then compose them there. And eventually the farm B got the same uh, disease. And by genomic, we showed that there was a connection between this farm A and B um, the outbreak. So yes, biosecurity is very important. Thanks. Um, I think the last question is from Raymond. Hi, Lida, thanks for the presentation. Is your work on poultry being published? And in your research, is the pastoral strains in the pig industry as diverse as poultry? Thanks, Raymond. Yes, uh, the work on chicken meat has been published. The work on chicken egg is, um, is in revision and with the reviewer for the second time. So I'm hoping to hear from them very soon. And the diversity in pig industry is higher than the one we saw in chicken industry. And uh, the, we are doing some work and comparing uh, the isolates, with, uh, comparing the, looking at the pig industry isolates as well. Yes. Okay. So that's all from the Q&As. Uh, I'll just uh, ask one last question. So um, in terms of uh, live and killed vaccine, what is the um, adaptability on farmers and how frequent the farmers adopt to vaccine their flocks regularly? And is there any evidence that the outbreaks on those farms which use live attenuated vaccines? Um, Ali, what you are asking is a, a linkage project. <laughs> I love your que uh, question. So um, there are farmers, there are veterinarians who use at the moment, uh, use the combination of both. So they do use the live vaccine and then they boost the immunity with the killed vaccine. As I said, the live vaccine carries LPS type one. So, and then, um, and just bear in mind, there is a difference between chicken meat and chicken egg production. So chicken egg, they, um, the hens stay there for up to 70 to 80 weeks. And they get two vaccinations, traditionally one around nine weeks of age and one around 12 weeks of age. But then the immunity apparently breaks when they get around 40 to 44 weeks of age in those uh, chickens. Um, there has been reports that, um, so therefore a lot of uh, farms at the moment doing a combination of these two, but um, there is no documented uh, study on the duration of immunity, even by using both uh, a combination of killed and um, live vaccine. Thank you. Thank you for wonderful answers and, and, a, and a great presentation, Lida. Thanks. So, no more questions in, in the Q&A. Um, so before we close um, today's session, uh, the next seminar is on Tuesday, 15th of October. You can visit Coffee Science Seminar webpage for more information about the seminars and, and, and to watch uh, today's seminars recording and all the previous recordings. Thank you everyone for, thank you everyone for attending today's seminar.